begin our next session, Imagining the Garden City. The presenter will be Dr. Tan Wee Kiet. The respondent will be Mr. Simon Tay. And the moderator for the session will be Mr. Ku Ting Chai. May I invite the three of them to come out on the stage? The next session, as uh, Ping Kuang said, is about the greening of Singapore. 50 years ago, as you heard Mr. Peter Ho said earlier, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew planted the first tree at the inaugural tree planting day uh, at Farrow Circus. And today, you know, we know what Singapore is. And I think Peter Ho also mentioned that you know, to make the greening of Singapore possible, you need a dedicated and efficient gardener. By that, he meant you know, top experts who know what they're doing. And one of the best gardeners who is still active today uh, is Dr. Tan Wee Kiet. Wee Kiet actually came back after being trained in the US and had his first professional career there as the director of botanic gardens. He saw to the expansion of the botanic gardens as we know it today. Uh, and then when the National Parks Board was formed, uh, he became the first chief executive uh, of the National Parks Board. More recently, I think uh, we have to thank him for conceptualizing, for planning, for designing, and now running uh, our most important Gardens by the Bay, which is our little equivalent of the Hyde Park in London or the Central Park in, in New York. So can I invite Kent to talk to us? You've been an amazing audience, you know, sitting two hours solid and being largely Asian, you don't even take pee breaks very obtrusively. <laughs> and so I will not be at all offended if you do. Um, you've had two really superb presentations and with it talking about the big picture that created Singapore. And this is, I think, why your attention spans have been so lengthened. Um, I'm talking about that portion of Singapore in infrastructure that allows the city to grow and allow people to live in it and leave the cement, concrete and brick to go into a communal space that is shared and where they can interact, where there are no cultural, truly no cultural restrictions for such spaces. And uh, very quickly, I shall start with, um, it actually really started on uh, 16th of June in 1963 when Lee Kuan Yew planted a Cretoxylum formosum to mark the commencement of the Garden City campaign. This simple act of planting a tree launched an effort that encompassed the efforts of several government ministries in the city-state of Singapore, culminating in a self-designated but universally acknowledged city in a garden half a century later. Today, it would seem self-evident that the commitment of such an effort is totally justifiable. But that was not the case in 1963, when Singapore was a nation of 1.8 million inhabitants, occupying a landmass of 581 square kilometers. And I think that uh, Peter's earlier pictures really indicated what it's... Well, to give you an idea, New York City is about 751 square kilometers or so. And Singapore is a nation in 700 kilometers, square kilometers. Well, the nation at that time was poised for a dramatic transformation from a relatively rural landscape studded with the beginnings of housing, industrial, and infrastructural projects to an intensely developed metropolis that resembles Hong Kong, Taipei, or Tokyo. The wish for Singapore to incorporate the elegant parks and gardens that had enhanced the urban spaces of some European cities during their development and growth was really the prime motivation behind the Garden City movement. Yet the concept of creating a gracious living environment with tree-lined streets linking parks and gardens throughout the city alone would have been a very difficult one to use in order to rally the populace during this period of Singapore's history. The more pragmatic rationale 
of attracting multinational corporations and investments into Singapore with the promise of a well-disciplined workforce as evidenced by the park line streets leading from the airport to the financial hub of the nation was far more compelling. And the results really have been well documented. I joined the Parks and Recreation Department in January 1983. By then, the, founding, the foundations of the Garden City campaign had been well and firmly planted. Changi Airport had been welcoming travelers to the island since its opening in 1981. Visitors and returning residents were conveyed along Singapore's most effective marketing ploy, the East Coast Parkway, right into the heart of the city. Along the way, the results of two decades of the efforts of the parks people, first from the Parks and Trees Unit of the Roads Division of the Public Works Department, and later from the Parks and Recreation Department, established as the implementing arm of the Garden City Action Committee. The Garden City Action Committee had been set up to coordinate the efforts of the relevant ministries and channel resources and directives of the Prime Minister in this greening effort. And that was done because there was so little progress into getting buy-in from all the various uh, uh, authorities into greening of Singapore at this period. Well, the minutes of the GCAC has been very well used, and Mr. Lee's immediate successor, PM Go Chok Tong, was to later remark that Singapore was the only sovereign nation he knew of that read a gardening report in the cabinet. Nevertheless, it had not been an easy journey. Very little civic sense had been engendered in the population at this stage. We would plant beautiful little trees around the streets, and the next day somebody would have dug them up and placed them in their gardens. <laughs> Plants were even being removed from in front of the Istana at that time. Moreover, many government officials had remained skeptical and even hostile to the channeling of resources towards what many considered a frivolous pursuit. And even the Minister of Finance at that time would uh, ask the parks officials to say, which route does Prime Minister Lee take so that you can green only those periods and uh, roads and you get <laughs> funds for those roads and that's it. Indeed, the entire effort would have been impossible without the steely determination and clear direction from the top. Fortunately, the people in PRD, the parks, parks people, were a dedicated bunch, carrying out every task with really, almost religious fervor. Through their efforts, a road reserve planting scheme was put in place and a road code institutionalized to safeguard the existing streetscape greenery provisions. And this was possible only because at that time, PWD was part of the Ministry of National Development, the Infrastructural Ministry, and all the agencies were then able to work hand in glove. We may have lost some of that as we divested some of these authority. Today's heritage roads are a result of this legislation. What we took for granted today, such as the beautifying of flyovers and Amco railings, the injection of color to the landscapes, and even the introduction of public orchards to instill civic discipline, came as directives from the top. You see, the, the ingenuous hope was that if you plant Fruit trees are plenty, people will stop picking fruits from, uh, well, but you know, people are people. You always want, you can't resist when you see a ripe mango in front of you and not pick it. But that was a hope. The greening up of retaining walls, which softened the impact of um, uh, much concrete surfaces which was to become the forerunner of today's vertical gardens of the, uh, of the garden city. In, today we are talking about green walls. It had its early beginnings here when uh, Lee Kuan Yew said, hey, these concrete walls need covering up, and we planted creeping ficus up them. And we even did that for the footings of the, of the high, uh, roadways. 
until the engineers complained that they couldn't in inspect them properly and we had to come to some compromise. The marvelous hierarchy of parks, gardens, and green spaces of today had already been established by the second decade of the campaign when I joined the service. Again, this had been no easy glide, even with backing from the top. The economic imperatives needed continual adjustment. In the early days, parks were usually pockets of space that were deemed less desirable for development and hence tucked away from easy access or they were developed for these estates that were not fully occupied and deemed wasteful because nobody was using them. Moreover, greenery was considered as being merely for decorative purposes and hence of lower funding priority to everything else. So it took a while for the heat ameliorating properties of tree cover to gain appreciation. As trees took time to grow, especially when young saplings were planted, and we had to plant young saplings because they were cheaper. But you know that over the years, the, the heat, island heat has been reduced for Singapore by two full degrees, and that is no small thing. The chorus of criticisms from politicians and the men in the street wax and wane with the financial fortunes of the state. It was little wonder then that the plant people were more concerned about the condition of their green charges than with the wishes of their payma and with the wishes of their paymasters rather than the intended benefits to members of the public. So there was a turning away from the public. We just concentrate on making sure that our greenery was healthy, we don't get complaints about them, and we get funding for them. Well, my internship with the Parks and Recreation Department as an Assistant Commissioner ended with the formation of the National Parks Board. As the then Secretary of the now forgotten Nature Reserves Board, and we had one, I was in the position to effect the transformation of the Nature Reserves Board to the National Parks Board. The Nature Reserves Board was a well-meaning well group that had no teeth, couldn't do a thing. And we just watched as uh, forests were cut and land was uh, dug up for quarrying activities. More than just a titular change, a paradigm shift was to take place. The focus of the end parks, national parks, had to be shifted away from the green estate and the welfare of the greenery to the needs and wishes of the intended beneficiaries of the Garden City campaign, namely the residents of Singapore. No brainer. The mantra was that greenery and green spaces were established primarily to benefit and improve the well being of the residents of Singapore. And that underlines the whole premise for the formation of the National Parks Board. A new compact had to be forged where the parks people had to listen to the key clans, and these clans must be educated to give realistic and implementable feedback instead of just plain old complaining. This also meant that there was to be realignment of perceptions and roles of the paymasters, which was no mean feat. It took six years of extraneous, uh, of really tremendous effort by the formative board of engaging the public, of the schools, teaching the young, bringing programs to the communities. It took six years before the government decided to re-merge the fledgling National Parks Board with the Parks and Recreation Department again. And under the new National Parks Board banner, this is a, a, actually a totally new organization. Underlying that mere pen stroke that effectuated the change were some truly agonizing organizational no and personal adjustments had to be made among the staff within both organizations. You know, it, it was akin to reattaching the tail of a dog that had been severed for wagging too hard. And the now the reattached tail had to wag the rest of the dog. There was a lot of resentment in that process. It took quite a few years for the new culture to take root and for the National Parks Board, as you see it today, to function the way it does. 
the transforming effect of these changes covering the third decade of the Garden City campaign also generated some key gains for both the profession and the industry. During this period, some seminal initiatives arose and some institutional growth took place and the parks and greenery professionals began to assume greater ownership of their roles in the greening campaign. We are actually starting to be more professional in our work and having the space to develop our professionalism. The quality of skills and the knowledge of staff had to undergo honing through training and education beyond merely on the job experience. This necessitated the setup of professional upgrading processes and pathways, shoring up the workforce with the key recruitments and an overall re-evaluation of the entire parks establishment and the supporting industries in Singapore. Um, we don't have a big nursery supplying us with stock for our greening. We rely greatly on our neighbor, uh, neighbors uh, in Johor. All these uh, nurseries in Johor had actually established their gene pool by raiding the, the seed bank of the Singapore Botanic Gardens over the years. And this was a very wise move and a very key function of a botanic garden. They provide the germplasm for a fledgling industry and we harvest the results because we didn't have the land and labor to grow this greenery. And so this is how a lot of the plants of the Garden City came about. Setting up the uh, training programs for specialist skills meant that we had to go to the US to engage the, the arboriculturists to come and train our staff. And then we established the Center for Urban Greenery and Ecology, huge which addressed the need to ensure the maintenance of requisite skill levels and knowledge among the staff. So actually, we really developed as a professional body. The awarding of internships, scholarships, and various training attachments complemented the effort in securing a very sustained supply of skilled workers. And we are also tapping into the group of young people they found that working with parks and greenery was actually a viable way of life. Uh, the ones that were turned off from the rat race, that they, not all the young just want to make money. They want to make their lives meaningful, and we provided an alternative space. Key initiatives developed during this period that are now finding greater resonance among Singaporeans today. And this include the first sky rise exhibition that is a forerunner of the Singapore Garden Festival. We had literally to drag some of our government officials around the world to other cities that were starting to address sky greenery, rooftop gardens, greening the walls. Uh, and we had to do it in countries that were very pragmatic, that were doing it for really social benefit, like in hospitals, etc. And uh, it underpinned Singapore's credentials today as a leading global exponent of the vertical garden. The Park Connector Network was approved in 1991 and has been growing from strength to strength. And this was only possible because the land uptake for these park connectors or greenways was on actually drainage reserves. And this is why we were able to do it under the radar because anything that deals with land attracted immense uh, attention. And we would not have been able to uh, develop the green matrix that today is underpinning the green backbone of Singapore. The, the infrastructural monuments in our parks are also given renewed respect and the proper treatment demanded. Uh, we, we cane people that vandalize our cenotaph and things like that, and we're very, very stern about vandalism. Fort Canning Park's revival as Singapore's park of history is a case in point. And today, this mature park in the heart of the city is still the seat of, of the history of Singapore dating from the days of ancient Tamasic. And it still is the best kept secret among Singapore parks because it's still underutilized in many ways, which is the way it should be, actually. 
The, this venerable green estate boasts some of the oldest trees planted in Singapore, as well as harboring an underground war chamber and festooned with artifacts from sites dating back to the Tamasic era. A wonderful place. And um, I still remember as we embarked on rejuvenating it, I was taking the chairman of the board through this, uh, at that time, just haunt, uh, the haunt for uh, courting couples. And a slipper dropped out of a tree. And the chairman looked up and saw a guy perched on the tree. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm bird watching. Sure, the birds he was watching were the dance studio girls dancing in the... <laughs> Well, the rejuvenation of the Singapore Botanic Gardens during this per period also began and is today underpinning the bit of the gardens as a World Heritage Site. The many years of careful nurturing of awareness of nature that began back then has finally resulted in a deeper and greater sense of ownership for the central core of Singapore, the central catchment, and the nature reserves. And people are actually appreciating nature for its, in its, for its value. And this is why it's not so easy nowadays to, to, you, uh, to use infrastructure that saves 15 minutes of travel time as a reason for cutting down forest. <laughs> Our natural heritage, previously given scant attention by heritage groups and agencies, have found renewed interest among greater numbers of Singaporeans today and forms a foundation of the growing understanding of the need to cherish and protect our natural environment. And actually, one of the tenets of the National Park Spot is the protection of historical sites. The corporate members of our community have also been playing important roles in the forging of the Garden City movement. HSBC was one of our earliest sponsors, corporate sponsors. We developed a Care for Nature program for them. And they, in turn, helped us develop green infrastructure, like the, the sky bridge across McRitchie that some of you should take part in. It's wonderful. This is where you see the bird life that you no longer see even in Sarawak. I, went, I just came back from Sarawak, home of the hornbills. There are more hornbills in Singapore. Then you have the uh, Sungai Bulo and Chek Jawa interpretation centers were helped by HSBC. We also had enlightened individuals such as Charles Letts, Lady Yuanping McNeese, and John Tan, who stepped forward, especially during critical times in the course of this long campaign, to educate our young, to our, educate our community. In fact, we were trying to get the first biodiversity survey of our nature reserves and could get no support from government because that would men, mean that it would be harder to develop gazetted nature reserves if we knew what was in them. And so we had to rely on sponsorship from our individuals. And this actually provided the base for today's understanding of what is there. These efforts have received recognition, sometimes commensurate, but often not. But then, so are the efforts of innumerable individuals who have made a difference in the greening of Singapore. Many of them are still working in the parks profession. Many are in NGOs that were only allowed a voice and a footprint in Singapore not too long ago. What needs acknowledgement, however, and this is a key thing, is the omnipresence of enlightened government support for the Garden City campaign. Throughout, if we didn't have the backing, you know how controlled Singapore is. Without this tacit understanding and agreement uh, and working in partnership with government, and we are a government body, then, only then, was the Garden City campaign successful. Complementary initiatives such as the first blue and green plan of URA the ABC program of the Public Utilities Board, the Singapore National Biodiversity Action Plan and the Streetscape Greenery Master Plan of NPARCs were instrumental in the dramatic increase in green cover of the entire island as shown in satellite images of the nation when the population grew from 2.7 million in 1986 
to 4.9 million in 2007, and yet you have an increase in green cover. That tells you the efficacy of the government agencies once they put their mind behind a project with support from the community. The near implausible support that led to the development of the gardens by the bay has given Singaporeans a garden to complement the Singapore Botanic Gardens. When you consider the gardens by the bay, this is actually a very, very original development that actually is very specific for Singapore in Singapore. It speaks to the phytogeographical uh, positioning of Singapore. It, we are in the land of perpetual summer, and only with that do we have that intense green cover for this garden. We have that cultural diversity that allows us to enrich this garden with our cultural heritage gardens. And the wishes of the public were being satisfied. They wanted to see plants in temperate countries. In fact, one of my first jobs was to try to grow roses in Singapore 30 years ago. Now I can do that by creating the conservatories. But only because we were able to come across with very innovative ideas and very creative ideas. And that shows you the control in Singapore is an informed control. There is leeway if you have good innovative ideas and you can push them forward with sound logic. And we were able, therefore, to convince what seems to be a, a, a non-thing, to have glass houses in the tropics. Imagine the energy drain. So we were bold enough to say we will only build conservatories in the, in the National Park Board only if the cost for cooling is less than cooling per square meter this room. And the only way we could do it was to have a team that worked together. We threw everybody under a container office. And every time we had a problem, everybody sat together and had the thinking caps on. And this is actually whole of government at work, but this is within one project. And we were, somebody came up with the idea, you are the National Parks Board, you generate a lot of wood waste, why don't you use that as a source of your energy generation base? And this is what's happened with this Gardens by the Bay. We created and built the uh, machine infrastructure to generate our own energy based on the wood waste generated by the National Parks Board today. And the cost of cooling those glass houses are much cheaper than if we were on the grid. We are still on the grid in case there's a massive failure, but being typical Singaporean, good civil servants, we make sure failure is covered by emergency alternatives. So, in many ways, the Gardens by the Bay culminates the Garden City campaign and sets the stage for improving and enhancing the total environment of our nation. We use this garden for education. We talk about biodiversity, germplasm. We talk about what it takes to, uh, why we need to preserve our, our uh, uh, green estate. And uh, at that time, we also had strong backing. People were willing in government to stick their careers to back, up, to back this project. And uh, I'm speaking about uh, our minister then, Minister Mabatan, who just joined us. The near, in the face of impending global change, both physical and possibly political, every resident in Singapore will be called upon to contribute to the effort in sustaining an equitable environment that we have come to enjoy and expect. And this means an informed community. The various agencies charged with taking care of our nation's physical environment will be severely tested. We parks people have our work cut out for us. Given the indications of ecological and edific change, that our nation will be facing in the years to come, increasing storms, global warming, etc., and tree and aging tree population having to be changed. Why? We will need every bit of professional knowledge and skill that we have amassed over the five decades, and also a ground that is very, very amenable to such work. So you can see, we engage the public, 
and sometimes uh, and the media in a way that had never been done before by government agencies. Uh, uh, maybe probably HDB is the closest to that because we serve people living there. So in closing, this kind of environment and possibility was made po possible by primarily two key people, Mrs. LKY, who moderated the impulsive no's from her husband <laughs> hmm? to allow us and a, and a husband who knows what is good for Singapore. And this is why we have a city in the garden campaign that is green and growing. Thank you. It's really a privilege to hear Dr. Tan Wee Kiet. I think, you know, he, no one else can tell the story of greening of Singapore like, like he does. And um, I say a privilege because for the last several years, I think he has been consistently refusing to speak publicly because he has been very, very busy delivering the gardens by the bay. I've asked a couple of times and I failed. Uh, and he only took the, the charm of Professor Chan Heng Chi to persuade him to come and speak to us today. So thanks again, Kat. Uh, the respondent to uh, uh, Kat is uh, Professor Simon Tay, who I think all of us know very well as a regular commentator of public affairs. He's currently the chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. He's a law professor at NUS. And he was uh, the chairman of the National Environmental Agency uh, and National Environment Agency, as well as a nominated member of parliament. Simon. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, uh, Professor Chan, for inviting me to be the respondent. I'm actually very grateful to respond to this panel. Uh, I was on the National Parks Board for few, six years, I think, with Wicket. And really, I'm a great admirer of his uh, principles, his ideas, his tenacity to try to get the government system to respond to the various things. And I would say that, you know, from the start, I take it that uh, the green things he's talked about are already part of the DNA, uh, whether through his work and the supportive ministers and others that he's talked about. Um, the second thing I'd say is that I'm glad to be on this panel about the city uh, and greening, rather than about some of the other issues like governance, heritage, diversity, and perhaps authenticity, where I think there are some more questions um, and I think that's the third thing I want to say, in, in that I think I'm the youngest person to speak so far, uh, which doesn't mean I'm young, but it means that the, 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 the conference is really so far centered around those who've really been very close to that founding generation that built the city. And if I may, uh, there'll be some other younger people like Aaron after this. I think there are some notes that need to be discussed about where to next and to question where we're really you know, in fullness where we've been. Because I would actually you know, try to add some value, I hope, by taking not the greening of the city in the focus that uh, Wikiat has got. I mean, I just cannot uh, in any way add to his knowledge and depth on that green aspect. But where I think the general thing is that the idea of greening has broadened. Our expectations of what we do about Singapore's green DNA is to be taken a step further. Uh, I first start by saying I think that from my perspective, not having worked closely with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, I nevertheless credit him, in fact, all the more I credit him, for really being an early greenie, not just in Singapore, not just in Asia, but really in the world. And this, you know, the history of Singapore, you look at the, the pollution control unit, the creation of the Ministry of Environment, these were really early in the, globally. The Ministry of Environment was started in the same year of the Stockholm Conference, 1972. And we were very early in recognizing the need to deal not only with the greening, which we care has focused on, but to weave that together with the pollution control, the cleanup of the streets, which the National Environment Agency was in charge of, the cleanup of our rivers and water sources, which are, of course later will be on a panel today, and today will be a very big day for Singapore's water sufficiency as well. So in this sense, I, I think that the whole weave has come together. Uh, uh, we can, of course, mention Chet Jawa, which is a national park. I'd mention Pulau Samaka. Pulau Samaka, I don't know how many of you have been there. Basically, it is a landfill. It is an incineration dust that the NEA then 
put into the sea. To create it, we had to create a large rubber liner, basically, between two islands, the old Samakau and another island. And if you go into the water there, you will find uh, you know, uh, starfish, uh, sea, some seagrass. Remarkable, because there is, on one hand, the, one of the oldest refineries in Singapore, uh, in the world, perhaps, uh, the Shell. And next to it, a rubbish field. And that in the middle of the world's, one of the largest, busiest harbors in the, in the world, there's all this, uh, uh, this, this na nature still there. And that talks about not so much the green, natural greenness of Singapore, but the ability of Singapore to administer and sustain and manage very well these different parameters. The second thing I come to, though, is having credited Singapore and the early role played by Lee Kuan Yew and the founding generation, is to pick up some of the notes of the earlier comments, that people today take that to be part of our DNA, and as all things, you know, the nature of change is that people take the accomplishment of last generation being the foundation, and now say, what more? So I, you notice that we can start to mention people towards the end of his uh, uh, speech. And I think that's roughly where we are today. Uh, the, really, the hard work has been done by some of the uh, uh, agencies like the parks uh, and even the NEA to really try to get people to own the environment, to own that greenness. Otherwise, the city is built for whom? Uh, it's not very clear. Now, WICAT's been the optimistic one. I think that's very true because in the green space he occupies, it is increasingly possible to get people to feel this affinity and despite the fact that men go into national service and treat the jungle as horrible, uh, after that, uh, they will go for walk, parks, uh, walks in nature, in, in nature, etc. But I think the other element of the greenness is a harder one. And this is where the National Environment Agency, which I chaired for six years, uh, was, is. And this is about, say, things like littering, keeping our streets clean. Uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Liu Taika said that we have no litter. Uh, that's, of course, the result. But the actual habits of Singaporeans leave plenty of litter on the streets. Then armies of cleaners with the latest equipment sweep it as clean as possible before dawn comes when you start walking around the streets. And we still have not solved this problem. We kept pointed to the 1963 tree planting and it's really been a success. But slightly later, we started the no littering campaign. And that has not been in the same way, that same ground up success. I think these are some of the remaining challenges that are still there for our society. Because in a way, when we talk about making a garden city, when we talk about greening the city, it speaks to basically not just development, but civilization. You know, to Voltaire, Candide, what better thing than to tend a garden? And this really takes a lot of time for people to balance off my need, you know, my development need, our national need, with the harmony that we kept talked about, finding harmony with greenness, finding harmony with nature. Now, let me then move on to my third point, and I'm going to finish quite soon. Um, my third point is about some of the international criticism that has come about. Again, a, a speaker I listened to earlier, and I greatly respect Liu Tai Ke, he said that one of the strengths of Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore was to go its own way, no matter what the international criticism is or was. And I do agree with that. As I said earlier, one of the great achievements in this green space was that Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew led before a lot of the rest of the world followed. But some of this criticism may have seemed a misplace at the time, but over time, really, has been corroborated by our own change of values. For example, there was criticism about Singapore's plans in the early stages of development to cut away our old heritage, built heritage of Chinatown. We recognized it and turned it around, not too late. And I still remember Minister Ma Bo Tan, when he was Minister for National Development in Vietnam. I, I was there at the Asia Society speech you gave. And he said at that point to the people, the planners of Ho Chi Minh, do not make some of the same mistakes we did. We corrected it. We now have 7,000 over uh, uh, conserved buildings. But we went through a phase where we thought this international criticism was wrong. Similarly, criticism about Singapore being soulless, I think that's been redressed, as Taika said. Singapore's green buildings, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, 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 Wiket told us about how he had to literally take people around the world to see what could be done to green buildings, both literally and in terms of the energy footprint. And there are still other issues. Bicycling, walkability, I don't think we're there yet. 
But when you go to Europe, these are some of the measurements, new measurements of what makes a green city truly green. Not just to walk through a park, but to walk through the whole city. And I think that's part of the challenge that we get, and I hope the coming generation of administrators and garden people uh, do embrace. To close off this point about the broadness of what we mean now by greening, again to touch on a point we just already said about climate change. Climate change for our city in terms of vulnerabilities of our city uh, and also our contribution to the problem in terms of our footprint. Uh, and of course, extending the issue even broader, our engagement with the region to deal with issues like the haze. The haze is like you know, somebody dumping rubbish when we've made all our efforts to clean up our own house. And something we must work together to really try to address. What next? I have three pet wishes, uh, or maybe four. Uh, one, I think, is that we should really be looking at the international criticisms or people who are ahead of us. We've done tremendously well to be a green city of such a rapid development in Asia. I would say we are ahead of almost everyone in this region. But there are other cities further ahead of us. We must keep our eyes on those front of the pack. Take what's pragmatically doable and do it. The second and related one is that when we do some of those things, while this conference is focused correctly on the Lee Kuan Yew legacy and the public sector legacy, we should embrace and encourage the private sector to participate much more clearly and deeply. They can be much more innovative, and I think they should be given broader precincts to experiment. Whereas you see what's happening now is that if, say, Keppel go off to China and get Ecosystem Tianjin, they get much more scope to play with than they get to play with here. The third thing I'd hope for is for environmental impact assessments and social impact assessments. If we are reaching a point where people do matter more and where they're more educated to participate in these policy planning decisions, while we will respect, I think, the very strong record, the planners and the administration, I think increasingly it's important to include the people in discussion. And the last thing, perhaps a little frivolous, is that I want to give WeCat a new park. We have a magnificent gardens by the bay. We have the old venerable botanic gardens. I would like to see a new park right in the middle of Orchard Road to give back that meaning of the word Orchard Road. <laughs> and this is the crazy part. I think it could easily be done in the lower part of the Istana. The gardens are open on national days and special days. Of course, the upper part beyond the second gate could be kept for security. But if the lower part was open permanently, there would be really a smack of green right in the middle of, uh, of Orchard Road. And of course, as far as I know, no one plays golf there anymore. So it's not a bad time to ask Mr. Lee to give it up to the people. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Simon. Um, I think both our speakers have been so eloquent and I think we are going gone past uh, lunchtime, so I won't attempt to summarize, but perhaps throw the floor open for a couple of questions uh, before we break for lunch. Yes, I think Mr. Victor Savage has a question. Well, thank you very much. Those are really interesting uh, presentations. I'm just curious that despite the fact that Singapore is so well known for its uh, Garden City image, why is it that domestically it seems to be the most contentious issue, uh, contentions between the nation society uh, with the government on the idea of saving you know, uh, natural greener. We seem to have done very well in terms of the cultivated garden, the, the, the sort of artificial greenery, but uh, we seem to be heavily criticized uh, both on land and in, in the marine areas for the natural aspects of our uh, heritage. Uh, and you brought up, Simon, the idea of the EIA, which has been a very contentious issue between the government and the uh, nature society. So uh, why is this the case? Uh, why is it that we can't solve this issue? Or is there a, a, a problem that is not needed? Thank you. Victor, I've been much informed by your publications during my tenure. Uh, is this on? Yeah. I would not call it growing uh, contention. In fact, 
when you're talking about green spaces and gardens, you're talking about living things that evolve. Even the environment evolves and the ground evolves. And I'm delighted at this ownership that's exerting itself from the people, from the community. They are now taking an interest in that aspect of Singapore that has always been considered as reserve lands for development. There's value in it, but now this is where the education aspect of it comes in, into play. Uh, one reason why I was targeted by greens, green uh, groups for being anti-nature because I was developing gardens instead of saving the pockets of greenery is that there was this lack of a, a p appreciation for leisure areas that's green and also developing it on reclaimed land. Imagine if all those people now going to the uh, gardens by the bay were to descend upon the central catchment. What kind of central catchment would you have? So there's all the green spaces that we developed is actually uh, complementary. And it doesn't mean that you give up one for the other. Now, we are talking about then those areas that have been actually not, where attention had not been placed on before by the public, where now that we are developing the bits of Singapore, every square inch in Singapore has, is covered by the plan. Now there's questioning for developing some of these areas that had been allowed uh, to go to nature. So because that has assumed some value for certain elements of our society. And I think this idea of EIA, which was something that was very, very much put in abeyance in earlier times, when Singapore had to move very fast ahead, if you had to do this kind of questioning for every move, do you think we'd be where we are today? But now, with uh, social media, with a generation that has, been, has grown up to expect the moment in for public hearing, we have to take a slower step when we develop. We have to canvas the ground, and we have to educate so that the criticisms if properly done, may be deflected or taken, taken on board in whatever uh, uh, development we take. So, as I see it, it's a very, very happy thing. Thank you. Can, uh, Kishore, yes. Thank you, Wicket. That was very inspiring. And I'm very happy to see your new beard, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the best ways, as you know, to progress is to make sure that you learn from the mistakes of the past and to say something outrageous. Eh? I suspect if you look back on Singapore's history, one possible mistake was the building of an expressway right through the heart of the uh, forest, you know, the Bukitima Expressway, which may have been necessary for transport reasons, but it was, you know, a disaster in other ways. So as you look back over the last 20, 30, 30 years, what are the mistakes we made that we can ensure you don't make again? To give you another concrete example, I think as you know, when we did our early reclamation, we tore down Badok Hill, and that was a mistake. So what are the main mistakes that we made and done to in the, in the natural environment that we should avoid making again? I do not know whether we would classify them as mistakes, as priorities. And I think that if you have your eyes on creating infrastructure fast and cheaply. Some of these things were done then. And that was in the days when nature was not valued as much. And, but it was recognized quite early that cauterizing Bukitima Nature Reserve from central catchment was actually a grave mistake, but it took time to rectify. Some uh, uh, baby steps have been taken in having a faunal link established and a formal bridge, not uh, without much effort. And so that is one ameliorating effort that's taken place. But now, as you notice, the authorities don't rush into doing things. And I think there are several contentious projects 
that you, uh, that you've alluded to that require some airing and they are being and it's being done and carefully considered and i think that everybody with a stake in this will be taking a very close look at all the uh, at the rationale for decisions made and i think this is the way civil society is uh, evolving and and i think it's not so much well then this is a way of preventing us from jumping into mistakes hmm? by by listening to a wider array of uh, uh, stakeholders that very firm control controlled by an indomitable will has also got to evolve and is evolving so that we now have more voices onto a plateau uh, for decision making. The, one of, for me, one of the most educational things that allowed me to grow as a professional was my close relationship with the Urban Renewal Authority. They allowed me to see how planning was done and how um, uh, other aspects had to be considered, other needs of a country nation, in nation building had to be taken on board before you make a decision. Well, it also allowed me, of course, to give my two cents worth in col coloring every square inch of Singapore with a different color pencil with a, with a price tag on it. So I think that that's, that's um, it's also uh, being considered in a different way today. I think we have a question from Dr. Gamin. Thank you. Uh, not really a question. First, I want to say I agree fully with what both speakers have said. Um, but I just wanted to respond to some of the questions, um, especially Professor Victor Savage's. Uh, as a former president of the Nature Society, actually I'm waiting for our patron, Professor Tommy Coe, to respond, but since he hasn't, I'm going to do it. Um, I think it's a mistake to say that the Nature Society and NPARCs were always at loggerheads. Um, don't you agree with me, Dr. Tan? Uh, but anyway, um, we, we may have appeared to be so at times, especially um, as the media depicted it. But I, 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 let me pay a tribute to Dr. Tan at this point, that he taught me that uh, he gave me a lot of insight, some of which he's shared with you today, that actually we are working together and it would be much better to our common purpose to work together. I really learned a valuable lesson when I took over as president of Nature Society from Dr. Tan on that. Uh, but maybe I could just add something here. Um, I think uh, Tan Ket is a much more subtle politician than he lets out to be as he's taken us on this journey of how he persuaded Singapore or got the green into our DNA. Of course, I believe that it's in our DNA. It just has to be brought out. But whatever it is, you know, <laughs> starting off with uh, tree planting and then going into the deeper green, I think was a very clever move because, as he has pointed out, going into the deeper green straight away might have caused a lot of um, controversy. And so, if I may suggest to the former chairman of NEA, uh, Professor Tay, you know, I think why the green took off so well and the cleaning didn't go off so well is that you let it come from the ground. Dr. Tan was very clever. He didn't come out with all these government policies that we must have 100% protection. He let organizations like mine, Nature Society, come up with our civil service, our uh, uh, civil servant, uh, civil mentality, civil sector, you see. It's so poorly developed, I don't even know what it's called now. <laughs> but civil society was allowed to grow in the green area in a way that it was not so in the clean area. That's my point. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, Simon. If, if you don't yeah. seem to be doing your job, then the people on the ground yeah. will take it up. Actually, the National Environment Agency has been now uh, taking steps in that direction. So there's the National Cleanliness uh, Awareness Project. And of course, for the waterways, that's a special waterways group. Uh, but I just mentioned that it was, you know, uh, in the early days, it was very top down. And still today, of course, there are, 
you know, NEA people roaming the uh, uh, far and wide to stop you from littering. And uh, new efforts like the, you know, pick up your own uh, dishes after, clean, clear your tray uh, at, any, uh, at hawker centres. That's something new we're trying. Actually, my, my own comment is, is it's not as kind of black and white as perhaps it's been painted out. I think uh, I'd like to point out that, you know, even the Nature Society in the mid-80s, when Mr. Danabalan was here as Minister for National Development, uh, Nature Society actually put up a, a very good uh, report on trying to preserve a bird sanctuary for Singapore in Sungai Bulo. And then thanks to leadership of Minister Danabalan, he asked the civil servants to look into the possibility of trying to you know, preserve a bit of land for, for the bird sanctuary. And today, we are, thanks, thanks to him and, and Parks, we, are, we have the Sungai Bulo Bird Sanctuary in the north of Singapore. And I think during Mr. Ma Baotan's term, uh, Okay, uh, there was a little bit of noise about Chek Jawa and Pulau Ubin, and today, you know, that that part of Pulau Ubin is also capped as a as a very nice uh, what do you call it sea grassland, right? Yeah, yeah. Can can we have a last question before we break for lunch? Yes, there are a few hands, you know. Um. <laughs> I got it first. All right. <laughs> Hello. Okay, uh, my name is Michael Tay. Um, this uh, question is posed to both uh, Mr. Simon Tay and Dr. Tan. Um, we've done so much in 50 years to green Singapore, so the big question is what next? Uh, we all know the intangible benefits of how uh, the greening of Singapore has uh, benefited uh, the whole country. So I take a leaf from what uh, NEC has done for the arts in Singapore, how it is uh, being funded and created to engage Singaporeans. So, would it be possible for us to think along the same way where a National Green Council, for example, be uh, created, similarly funded if possible, so that we can engage more Singaporeans into learning to uh, enjoy greenery, look after our greenery, just like the ABC Waters program is trying to make Singaporeans look after its waters. Because I think this is the only way that we can truly become the garden city of Singapore and probably the world. <laughs> There's, uh, there are other questions. All right, perhaps we take other questions and tell, tackle all of them. Well, since this conference titled Lee Kuan Yew and the Physical Transformation of Singapore, I'd like to know really what did Lee Kuan Yew think, never mind whether he had influence of what was eventually the cabinet decision, on uh, the struggles with uh, Lower Pierce Reservoir, which didn't become a golf course, the Sunoko, which was then taken away, uh, Sungai Bolo, which was saved, Chek Jawa, what were his thoughts about nature as it was? And uh, maybe his thoughts now also. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's what I would like to know. Thank you. Anyone else before we tackle? Okay, all right. I'll go first because I think we get as much more wise things to say. Uh, what next? I think um, the directions you've talked about, civil society participating more, uh, also taking over some of the burden of doing things and funding things, which we get pointed to has started. I think that would be the next step. But of course, the ability for civil society to take up those roles in a way requires the trust of government to let some of those roles go. And I think that... Uh, what Gaimin and others have said about actually it's not so black and white. That's encouraging. It's an area where both government and people care about. It's just sometimes that care and rational choice it comes out slightly differently. And so it is an intense but I think increasingly uh, 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 deep conversation rather than just simply mudslinging back and forth. Um, and I don't know what Lee Kuan Yew thinks about those issues, but I imagined uh, that given his strength of rationality and his very start of the green of city of Singapore, I hope he would take great encouragement that people have taken up his initial uh, seeds, literally, pun intended, and grown it into a, you know, a tree of its own life. Um, and so I think, I think that's the key issues that I think that uh, uh, face us in terms of our own society. But what next, I think, are also the bigger issues. It was also uh, uh, then Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew 
we started talking before the government officially did about climate change. Uh, uh, back in uh, 2007 and six, I think he gave some spe mentions of them in speeches. And I think this is very prescient of him uh, in terms of long-term thinking about the vulnerability of our country. As for uh, Michael's idea of having a green council, um, is this a direction to go in the current social media age? Do we still want to form an anachronistic councils and boards and so forth? Or should it not be uh, into uh, the, the media today that is easily connected by internet? Um, something that uh, allows a, a wider, broader spread of voice. No doubt, in some cases, less focus, less uh, intelligent, less schooled. But that may be a direction to go. Um, as for who doesn't want to know what LKY thinks? <laughs> I would love to know what he thinks about everything. Um, but I do know that I've seen how he takes on new lessons and how he learns. In my early years of going around the Istana with him and Mrs. Lee, it was always to make sure that all the uh, weeds and stuff were taken care of, everything was immaculate. Remember, this is a guy that said we should clean the trees of parasites that included all the ferns and orchids in earlier years. But he has changed as he learned. And in fact, one of the, 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 the more recent things uh, in, in recent times was as we went around the istana was, why don't we leave patches of it to go into grass? Then you will have the finches growing. So this is a measure of a man that is always taking on new lessons is learned. Okay, I think on that note, I think we'll bring this session to a close uh, for lunch. I think you'll agree with me that it's been a very engaging session with uh, with the Chief Gardener of Singapore, we can. And you know that you know, keeping Singapore green, green is not just about planting trees, but there's a whole lot more to it. And increasingly, it's an, it's an issue that goes beyond just the people in end parks with the religious fervor. There's, it's still there. Uh, but increasingly, it is something that the community has to take ownership of. And I think that's something that, that is, I think, moving very well in the direct, right direction. So with that, uh, thank you for Let's give a show of hands to two to, to panelists.